I would like to introduce two distinguished international director cinematographers who are with us today, and both of them have films here at the festival, which is very exciting. I'm going to start with Shaul Schwartz on my right. Uh, Shaul is an award-winning photojournalist who's based in Brooklyn, New York, and his debut documentary, Narco Cultura, premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2013. He's a regular photographic contributor to Time and Nat Geo, and has directed content for many American and international um, broadcasters, CNN, History, Discovery. In 2016, Shaul directed the Emmy-nominated web series, A Year in Space, which was produced with Time Magazine. I'd also like to just take this moment to introduce Shell's um, co-director and co-cinematographer who's here with us today. If you could take a stand and we'll introduce Christina Crucial. Thank you for being here. On my left, um, from Norway, I would like to introduce Egil Haskul Larsen. I was trying that out this morning in front of the mirror. <laughs> um, he has worked as a cinematographer and director since finishing his studies in 2008. He studied fine art photography, you see there's a little correlation here, in Turkey, and then studied documentary filmmaking in Norway. In 2016, he released his first documentary film, Ad Astra, and Tomorrow, on Sunday at 6.15, 69 minutes of 86 days, his first feature-length film will be shown at Showroom One. And just also to mention, uh, tomorrow, Sunday at 2.45, Shaul's film will be playing at the Bertha Dock House, so I hope you'll come out and support these two wonderful films. We're going to do it slightly different this time. We like to change it up a little bit. Shaul's going to start and show some of his marvelous photographs that were the inspiration for his films, and then we'll go directly to Egel, and then we'll open it up for questions, and you can fire away at both of them. So we'll do it a little bit differently this time. So take it away. Hey, um, thanks for having us. So I, as as we said, started from a photographer point. Most of my life, I uh, spend running around in a quiet zone, if you will, to to make these pictures one by one. And I'll take you first through a couple of pictures through Israel and the West Bank. And this is back in 05, and I think this is about seven, eight years into my career where I started to get these images, but I felt I was impactful visually, but I couldn't really tell the complete stories. And this is a struggle I kind of continue to have throughout my career, which led me to filmmaking. I l fell in love with a single image. I, I would cover a lot of Israel. This is going back in 06 to the Lebanon War. And I knew what I was doing, and I loved this idea of being alone, of being in a very quick to get to places. I always would see TV crews and heavier people, and I, I felt we, the photojournalists, had this kind of quick access. We could intimately inject ourselves and be sort of this fly on the wall that we always wanted to be. Again, this is all work from going back to my home country as well in the Lebanon. And back in 05, I ended, I, I, I spent a lot of time before the Gaza disengagement and I tried to make a film. And the tools back then um, were quite limited. And I eventually, after a year of trying, failed to do so. I put together a rough cut and the only one who would ever see it would be me. Um, and I think to some degree it was due to the inability of getting the impact I was getting from photography into filmmaking. The tools were not right, I didn't know enough what I was doing and I was very obsessed with this rawness of access, was beauty. I, I always joked that I was very interested in history and documentaries, but as a kid I hated documentaries because I felt like it was schooling. I wanted them to be pretty, I wanted them to be entertaining. And I wasn't able to achieve it in my first get around, and so I kind of fell back to photography, but always felt a little bit silenced by the inability to tell a complex story. Um, this is more work from that time in Israel. And again, this, this magic that was hard to leave behind was this intimacy, this, this ability to not make a complex plan, to be alone, got me very close to subject, got me 
to think of what I want to say visually to a story I want to say, which was very fulfilling in the photography medium, but I didn't know how to translate that. It kind of spun me on a, on a way that I, I would start going around the world and photographing a lot of conflict. This was Kenya. And after the attempt to make a film, I just continued to work. My career kind of spun up. I was working for a magazine, and I could do what I dreamed to do. Um, this picture in Haiti was acclaimed, and this was one of the inspirations. It, it, it was, there was so much violence in, a, in that time in Haiti, but this picture kind of landed on a lot of front pages. And Time Magazine ran it, and it said it, it's, it has come to this, a kid looting meat and Port-au-Prince, and it uh, made one of my less favorite George Bush president come and give a big statement of how we must end this conflict. And it, it, it was this idea that you could affect, but still I was feeling very limited. This is from the same series in Haiti. Um, my relationship to Haiti kind of stayed, and I went back for the earthquake. And this was actually, I landed there, and I took these devastation of the earthquake, but I had a magical new tool called the 5D, and with a click of a button, it went to video. And for the first time, I felt like in a tool world, the same camera I was used to looking through was actually creating similar feelings. So I ended up making a short film uh, from Haiti, and it really triggered me to say, you know what, it's possible. Now I could try and visually tell the stories I want in a shape that would become a film. Um, this is all the work from Haiti. And again, I, n I never wanted to lose this rawness, this connection of being, being there at the front lines, but really not telling just the conflict, but telling the feelings and the emotions and the little ironies of what those brought. And then I went to Mexico. I had a deep relationship with Mexico, and in 2008, the violence surged. Um, and I started photographing, particularly in the town of Ciudad Juarez on the American-Mexican border. And the pictures were quite impactful, and they were widely published. And I, I was just obsessed. I would go fly to El Paso, get over the bridge, walk from a reality into a complete different reality. And to my surprise, it was getting very widely published. And I was one of the first foreign photographers to be able to get this kind of access. And I would just see these horrific sights again and again. This was, at the time, the kind of capital of death of the world. But it was leaking into completely different territories of life. It was kind of everywhere. And I wanted to capture the drug war in a more complex way than the bodies. I wanted the people who use it, the drugs. I wanted to show what it's doing to the safety and to the migration of the border. I wanted to see how it looked on the American side. And most of all, I wanted to understand, and I was shocked by how much these guys had become cultural heroes. And it was shocking to people who didn't understand, but to me, after spending a lot of time in Mexico, I, was, I completely understood why they were seen this way on both sides. And even though I got my first Nat Geo assignment to tell the cultural effects of the drug war, this is a film about narco corrido, I, would, I couldn't really get to that place where I understood that complexity, and that led me to my first film, which dealt with not only the drug war, but these singers and this idea that you f fell in love and wanted to be these guys. And so with this, I'll, I'll play the trailer to Narco Cultura. So, Narcocultura was shot by me alone with a 5D. It's not the way I would continue to shoot films, but it fit that transition that I wanted to, to feel in control, to not lose the axis, the, the uniqueness that I felt. 
I think from ever since, A, I kind of put photojournalism as a secondary and became a filmmaker because I fell in love with this medium. And B, I always kind of question every film and every project I start, how do I want to achieve this? How do I want to shoot this? Um, there's there's kind of endless amounts of toys now for us as cinematographers, as directors going into documentaries. Things have really changed. There's steady cams and mobilizers and drones and high-end cameras. And they're all extremely effective. They do really well at taking that thing I hated as a kid as making documentaries shaking and boring into this medium that's powerful and visually entertaining. And yet there's that balance that I achieved with Narco, which I felt that I wasn't affected. I didn't become heavy. I didn't lose access. I didn't alienate my subjects. And I, I kind of encourage all filmmakers to always try and weigh these things as much as they can. And so the next project I want to talk to you about was almost a complete opposite. Uh, by then I was mainly uh, shooting and co-directing with Christina, my partner, almost everything. And we, we were asked to do a project, a, a project that would become A Year in Space, which was a sequence project, 12 episodes, about 15 minutes each, about Scott Kelly, an American astronaut, breaking the American record of spending a year in space. And off the bat, I remember sitting there, and you know, they, they were starting to show me, they said, you know, Red put a camera in space for us. I was like, oh my god, I was shooting with a 5D. I just had the craziest company fly a camera to space for us. And, and I, I thought, this would be amazing. We should use this. But how do we stay intimate? How do we mix those? And I was never much of a, I wasn't that interested in space. I wasn't a space geek, in a sense. And I, I wanted to use that both cinematography-wise, director-wise, to actually try and attract people like me. And so I wanted to tell a space story a little bit differently. Um, I want to show you a clip from the fourth episode. There was a lot of build. What we end up doing is mainly following the mission, but we also followed Scott's family. And we treated it as kind of a one year, almost like a soldier going to a conflict. Now you're going to be separated for a complete year. And so we went to Baikonur, Kazakhstan, where the launch was to take off. And you know, keep in mind, these launches are very impressive, but they happen a couple of times a year. There's hundreds of cameras there, a uh, very hard environment. And one of the tricks we decided to do is into keeping this balance is we had someone from Canon come and help us, and Marco Grobe, a photographer that was working with us, wanting to set up multiple camera traps we end for the launch itself. Um, the day before the launch, the Russians came and said, Sully, all your paperwork, no, you can't set up any of these traps. And so we had eight cameras beyond the three of us filming uh, this event. And we decided that wherever we stand to film the launch, we're going to place the camera traps instead of right at right near or in different areas right around the rocket, we were kind of going to take this different look at it. And I think looking back, the Russians did us the biggest favor. But this, uh, this project wants to show almost the complete other nature of, of what you could do with high and more tools and are trying not to lose that intimacy. And so we're about end of episode four, it's about 60 minutes into this show, and we'll show you this clip of the launch. And so, of course, light is, as photographers and cinematographers, is the biggest tool we have to use work to work with, and I think in this case, it was literally 20 minutes before where we just decided, let's run crazy and set, because we, we were going to give up on these cameras. And the big decision is everybody constantly said, you won't believe how bright it's going to be. This middle of the night is just a holer. And so most, I think, six out of the eight traps we, we put, um, we decided not to actually film the rocket, but to film the light and the, what it will change. And um, it was this weird gamble, and I remember kind of all looking at each other like, this sounds good on paper. Are we really doing this? There's one shot. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But um, So I think the last 
clip and the last uh, story I want to show you and talk to you a little bit about the choices into going to cinematography is from Trophy, the film we have playing now. Um, Trophy, I think, represents a lot of the work me and Christina like to do, which is try to understand someone who we really don't understand initially and try to stay open and not actually make an advocacy film, but actually question ourselves. And it was hard. It's, it's about big game hunting and about the idea that we can use economic models on wildlife to conserve them, something that when I heard it first, I just shook my head. I was like, no way. And as we got into this issue, it proved more and more complex, and we wanted to, on one hand, really challenge those who praise it, and on the other hand, we wanted to listen and not to shut it out. And so we had to come up with a cinematography language to do that, and one thing we decided to do, we noticed that hunters and people portraying these pictures would kind of clean everything up. So they would hunt something, they know how it looks, it was bleeding, it was ugly, it was shot, it was, but they would put sand on it and clean everything and kind of shoot it in a way that was picturesque. And so we wanted to take our cameras to intimacy with this animal human relationship to the point where you will feel some discomfort. But do it elegantly, if you will, use those bigger toys of cinematography enough not to break that axis. So it wasn't a year in space production, it wasn't a million cameras, it was two people on the ground. But we did decide to use drones and movies and, and, and different tools to kind of get us close and get us into this place. So I'll show you a quick clip about one of our characters collecting crocodiles to be hunted at a croc farm. So I guess my last thing is through my journey through working with cameras in both mediums, I, I always care first and foremost about the story to tell and the people. And I think I try to really think very strongly what different tools will bring to the table. I think doc people tend to be a little dismissive about using visual language sometimes to its full effect. And I urge you to try and get there. I, I came from that minimalistic background. I was very wary of going in and becoming kind of heavy as a production and not being able to achieve the visual impact. But look back at your project in an honest way. Most people who are our viewers are not as obsessed as I was with Juarez. They don't want, and you have to work all the cinema magic possible to bring him to the table and cinematography is kind of your biggest tool with the storytelling. So just use it to the most you can. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing to see uh, the images and uh, his ability to be close at the situations. And I also come from a still photography background. So I have the same mentality of, you know, capturing that one frame that will stick with you or will stick with an audience. And we saw some of, like, magical examples of that from, from Saul's pictures. And my, my way into uh, to documentary filmmaking was somewhat the same, maybe, as Shaw was showing us, that I was starting out with still photography, more from an arts perspective. Uh, and I also really like the idea of trying to make uh, documentaries look as brilliant or as magical as maybe some of the some of the fiction films that we see. Or uh, maybe I was the same kind of kid as you were <laughs> that really didn't like <laughs> documentaries to that extent, uh, which uh, I felt sometimes they were pushing information down through my head a little bit. Uh, but I fell in love with a lot of different styles of documentary, and there's a really wide, uh, like, wide gamma of different 
styles and different types of documentaries that are just amazing in the way that they are telling their stories. Um, so, um, but for the film that I'm screening here at the festival, uh, I also had, I was also thinking a lot about the visual approach and I saw a lot of these types of images and the Im even some of the images uh, that Shol Saul took from, um, from the Israel conflicts and um, for me, uh, seeing so many images from Syria now and from the from the refugee crisis that was going on, uh, or or impact was that we were kind of feeling that these types of images were kind of drowning us as audience. They were kind of taking over our image of everything that was happening and turning them into something that we were like having a little bit of troubles relating to. So. For example, the book of Susan Sontag there regarding the pain of others is kind of going through that, how that development has gone in history and how we are perceiving images. And we were inspired by those types of images because they were really showing us the horror or the like really super close to what was actually happening and you had the feeling that you were actually there. So we wanted to combine the, that too, but telling a story that wasn't so brilliant that wasn't so extreme that wasn't so maybe yeah close in the sense to the horror that was going on but more on the human like humane level like something that we maybe all could relate to as a family or as a, somebody who has kids and somebody who has yeah um so that's where the film that we're going to see now started um but at first, I just wanted to ask, because there is a really nice audience, it's a lot of people, I just wanted to know, are, are all of you directors, or how, how is it, like, could everybody who's a director raise their hand, so we can get a little, yeah, there you go, that's quite a lot. And how many of you are cinematographers, maybe both? Okay, yeah, not too bad. Uh, how many have filmed ever in their life? I hope is everybody, yeah. so to some extent, <laughs> like you have a cell phone, probably you took a <laughs> picture at some point in your life. And this is something that uh, I remember I, I went to a master class with Viktor Kozakovsky, uh, who some of you may know, um, who also has been the editor and I'm collaborating now with him uh, in his next film as a cinematographer. And uh, I remember he told me, I think it's eight years ago, so I'm, distant film festival in Norway uh, where he told me that we we really have uh, and he's really you maybe you know him but he's uh, um, let's call him an ambitious guy uh, but he said that we have a we have a challenge like meeting the new audience that are coming up now like they have an extreme set of visual ideas and they have seen so many films they have so much they have filmed so much themselves which is amazing, uh, and taking so many photographs and this relation to visual images and visual content uh, is changing a lot. So he was saying that we have a really tough task in front of us that we have to find our own kind of uh, direct cinema or our own cinema verite, uh, Albert Maisel's kind of style that fits uh, uh, let's say this time and this is something that stuck with me so uh, I was talking to him the other day about it and uh, we, we we were going really hard into this new film that he's making and trying to make a visual uh, visual style and as you can see from Scholz also mentality is that he's working really hard to find the right concept finding the right tools finding the right ID may be the right mindset to approach the different ideas and the different themes and the, yeah to be able to fit it to the yeah in the right way. Um, so I just wanted to start off uh, showing a clip from my film. It's uh, it's not the opening first clip, but it's uh, from the opening sequence of the film. So um, at this 
this is the opening scene, and we're like we are searching for something. Uh, it was a really nice talk in the beginning, beginning, beginning of the day. I don't know if everybody was here, but we were talking about the the structures of storytelling, and uh, and she was having a really nice. She was describing really nicely how that we are searching for something, or she was dividing the different types of stories into different types of mentality, and it was really interesting to hear that. And um, in this particular story, we know, knew what we were trying to tell. We had already decided that we wanted to tell a child's story from a child's perspective. Um, and this idea came out of us watching some of the horror that was going on in Europe and in Syria at that time, as I told you earlier. Um, but we wanted to find that familiar story, that story that we could relate to somehow from a, like a personal, at a personal level. And there was an image in the news uh, that really triggered this idea, and it was that image of a father holding his boy when he has just landed with the rubber dinghies that they crossed the sea from Turkey. And he was, you could see from his eyes that he was like crying of joy and crying of sadness at the same time. And he was holding his little child. So we imagine, I always do that when I go into a new film or a new idea, that I try to imagine the, per, like the perfect kind of scenario for the ideal scene. Like some kind of utopia that you will find this perfect scene within this story that will be like the, the main scene or some like really important scene. So the idea of this film was that we were going going to go down to Kos, the, the first island that felt some of the pressure coming from Turkey at that time. This was 2015. And I was imagining that we would be standing with the camera rigged on a steady cam rig, uh, waiting for the, the boats to come in. And we would kind of glide towards the boat and meet our main character there on the spot. So we would basically choose our main character on the fly and then follow find her in the crowd and follow her, uh, this little child, uh, instantaneously uh, from a, in a very long take. And this was really hard. <laughs> <laughs> Ambitious. <laughs> um, so uh, actually, we had a really big problem because we didn't even get to film any of the boats landing. So we were really in the shit because I had imagined this thing to be the one scene that would, you know, like the killer scene that would take us into this beautiful character and then it's gonna be a, a nice documentary film. So we had a really hard time at that island trying to figure out uh, how to get that scene. Uh, so I had to change my idea a little bit. I only had to change the opening scene of my film, so some of the things that you see here. Uh, because we found this little girl, this amazing little girl, uh, in the middle of the crowd, uh, she was like standing out as this beautiful character, so we wanted to elude that as a, as an idea of finding that one person out of accident that would take us into her story. So this first scene that you saw now was just a, a like an introduction, like a, a prologue where we are searching for our main character, trying to ideally, trying to imagine that who of these people are we going to follow, which of the stories are we going to see. So then maybe we could play the second clip. Uh, this is where we kind of, where we find uh, our main character. The, the main idea that we had be, when we started this thing was that I wanted to make that one image come alive. And this was, uh, this was something that we were also trying to find how could we tell a story that would be like a lasting image. So I decided that we wanted that lasting image to be told as a long take. We want to use some of the, like, in history of cinema there has been a lot of films idealizing the long take. And um, I wanted to use that for this film. Uh, in, um, and trying to enhance the feeling of being present, like trying to enhance the feeling of being together with this little girl, uh, being very close, but at the same time being able, without editing too much, being able to move uh, fluently 
between the different um, uh, places of interest, or wh how do you want to put it? So throughout the whole film, we're kind of following this little three-year-old girl's journey together with her family throughout the whole of Europe, starting off at uh, this Greek island. Um, and for me, it was really important to try to stick with that idea, that those small dogmas or those that uh, kind of set of rules that we had made for ourselves. Like we wanted to follow the kid, and never go away from the idea of the kid, even though something extremely, extremely dramatic and extremely interesting and wonderful stories happening over there and over there and over there. We would stay with the kid's story only, and we would film at her height all the time, like staying with her down at her level. We would always try to enhance the idea of the long take because it's a totally different set of mentality in how you, how you approach your story. Are you thinking about editing? Are you using it for a long take purpose? Are you thinking about it as a, yeah. So we desperately try to cling on to that, even though knowing that everything basically went to hell the first five days we were trying to get our opening scene, which was my kind of, what I had imagined would be the, like the, the, the beginning of the film, setting the premise for the tempo, the style, everything. Um, but it turned out, even though there was a lot of hard struggles, uh, something that actually, yeah, it, it was very beneficial to stick really hard and persistent to your set of rules. And this is something I, I strongly encourage people to do, that they should set out a lot of rules, like much more rules than you can almost imagine, and then start to cut them away <laughs> when you realize that things are going on a little bit, like when you meet reality. So, yeah. Um, I think the best for me, it would be to hear some of your opinions about uh, the, this topic because yeah. we are handling, we are kind of in the same genre, but we're doing maybe different things at the same, like in so any let's case. So open it up to the floor. If you have some questions, there's some roaming mics, so it's a great opportunity to talk about visual imagery and all things visual and story. Hi. Uh, can I ask, what kind of steady cam rig did you use, and how did you deal with recording sounds as well? Um, yeah, I uh, I used a steady cam steady cam rig, so it's a bigger steady cam. Uh, I, I don't know how specific you want me to be, but I guess uh, how did you stay intimate? You know, if you if you had a big rig and a and a sound guy with a boom. Ah. You know, how did you keep that intimacy with, with your character? Yeah, we were throughout the whole, actually half of the trip, we were two people. So I had rigged a kind of sound system thing on my Steadicam. So it's a boom microphone on the Steadicam, uh, because I knew I would always relate to my only one subject, which I would be fairly close to all the time. So, and on top of that, I had a translator with me for half of the trip. Um, and he would do like additional sound, but we were like uh, we were basically as a one person, because uh, yeah we had a big steady camera, a big camera. Um, yeah. yeah, and just to jump into that, the croc scene that I showed was shot on a smaller on a Movi with a 5D, and we shot most of the film on 4K and kind of higher quality. Uh, but we just knew that tool for that day is going to be useful to get close and to keep that motion that we wanted. I think this idea of making the rules and thinking is so important. And then you have to adjust. Like, we had the same problem. We normally don't work with a soundman. That day we understood we should because it's going to be so key. And once one of us was not on the movie, we couldn't put the mics uh so I think it's always like, and we didn't probably have a budget to do so planned such great study cam shots. Um, I think I think if there's a will of there's a way. The most important thing is to actually really pre-production think these set of rules. What can I do to enhance? Why is this like to me watching the material beyond the beauty of it? I immediately felt like I was part of the journey because I was floating with that little girl and I was in motion and I was never steady. So in a it, it puts you into a movement 
feel. So I think it's these kind of ideas that you make into a technical, okay, how am I going to achieve this? Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, equipment always has a, it, it is something that, uh, like choosing the right tools for doing your job is extremely important, of course. But at the same time, uh, finding the right approach, finding, there are like too many concerns to be taken, so, but there are a lot of tools out there, so it's really, it's important to keep track of what is, what will make your life a little bit easier, maybe, or, or more complicated, for that matter. <laughs> <laughs> Someone here? Uh, he's got a mic. Hey, Gil, I'm Alex. Okay. Uh, the long takes, amazing uh, technical accomplishment. I was wondering, with regards to those rules that you had in your head, I was wondering if you could tell me about, if you had any rules about where you thought you were going to end the shot. Were you editing in your head on the fly, or is that something you did in post? Uh, and, you know, where did you want to finish it up? And were you looking out for that when you were filming? Um, yeah, it's, it's always a little bit, it's more, it turns a little bit more complicated when you already have made up your mind that you want to yeah, use, for example, long take. The, the whole film is not just five takes, it's 70 minutes long, so it's like, I don't know, 65 takes or something like that, so it's not that extreme in that sense, but um, you just have to have a kind of a nose for when things might happen, so you have to start your take a long time before uh, the, maybe the actual scene happens. So then maybe it turns out nothing and you will delete the whole thing. Uh, so you kind of have to gamble a little bit. I, I had only seven hours of raw footage for this film because we were going really light. I didn't have any chance of backup. So in that sense, you also have to take care a little bit about how much you film. Maybe a little bit like in the old days when you had film stock. But um, And this is also... I didn't want this as a rule, but it kind of also made your mind a little bit more focused on what you actually wanted or needed to film. So then suddenly all the other rules that I had made kind of helped me a little bit in taking the right decisions on when to film and when not to film. So yeah, it's good. With I, I like rules. I'm a rule guy, but uh, <laughs> you can do what, like, your things, but yeah. We could call it 65 takes and 69 minutes <laughs> <laughs> in 86 days. And Shaul, what would you say to that? Uh, you know, I haven't used that technique. It was, it was beautiful. Um, to me, like, it, it just seeing this for the first time, it, like I said, kind of helped on this visually. I, I think at the end of the day, it's, it's not, it's again, these set of rules are made to be broken, but I see so many people who don't go into it thinking of them. And that's, I think, what we're trying to encourage to... The, the, your visual language, we saw it in fiction, in Birdman. It, it, it completely changed the script of that movie because of the steady cam and those long takes on that film. So there is no right or wrong. You know, you, you could have a film where the character grabs his iPhone and says the most amazing moment in the film. But the point is you should try and think what works for you when you're developing the film. And if you're not a DP and if you're not technical, because the magic of docs now is that these tools are way more affordable and available for the most part than some people think. So spend that kind of push to, to get yourself this target visual style because it will help you direct. I think it's more also that uh, I totally agree with, uh, with you. It's, it's something that um, if you start going through some of the ideas and some of the kind of results that making rules or making kind of concepts, uh, it will help you at least to understand what benefits you have. For example, you know that you are extremely, you, you, have, ex you are, have the ability to be, to be extremely close. Maybe using an iPhone and being extremely close is a really good thing because you will be more close than using a bigger camera. So if you go through all of these benefits and these benefits, uh, um, then maybe you will find that right tool or find that right uh, closeness or distance that is unique for your special film. And for this film, it was this. I wanted to do that because it was important for this story that I wanted to tell. And the same with Shaw was doing 
his thing for the two different films that he was making, or three actually. So, yeah, it, it can help. Language. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question, or maybe two. Okay. Hi, I'm Lee. Um, I understand that both of you are director and cinematographer, so most of the times you decide what kind of shots you want. But when you work with another director, mm -hmm. then eventually he decides, he or she decides what kind of shots um, they want. So I wonder in those cases, um, how do you communicate your ideas with the director and um, like how much anatomy that, uh, autonomy that you have on, on your shots? Thank you. I'm so glad you asked that question. Yeah, it's a great <laughs> question. Me too. Uh, I think it's like anything. It's a, a real, the DP director, just like editor director, is this kind of magic relationship. You know, they we need each other, and it's it, it it depends how much influence you get. You know, there's I do some jobs as a DP. It's not my main thing, but uh, you know, I try to do stuff that interests me and that I bring in a visual language and have this conversation and not just kind of be a robot um, or say, oh, make it pretty. How do we make it pretty? Because, you know, that's not really a tool. Um, but, you know, I think most directors who are not shooting themselves are usually, they're aware of that. They, they want somebody who could say, you know, who can brainstorm or cares. I think some, the problem is if, if you're a director and you're talking to to a DP and there's just kind of like, well, we'll put up the camera and we'll do the interview, then something's wrong. Like, there needs to be some discussion of, of trying to achieve. What are we saying? Understanding. And it takes time to come up with something that might be a super simple formula or a complex formula, but to get there is, is a long back and forth. And so, yeah, I, you know, it, the truth is some jobs you don't get to push the buttons too much and shame on the director because you could probably, you know, and it's their film. Um, but I try. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I work a lot, I, I've worked a lot as a DP, both for fiction and for documentary. And uh, I'm shooting uh, several documentaries now and it's always a different thing with each director has a different set of ideas of how they want to do it and maybe who they worked with before and what kind, type of film they're doing. So it will be different for each director. But uh, I always encourage the director or the producer and the director to sit down f as much as we can together before we start shooting. If you're shooting a fiction film, you will maybe make a storyboard, you will make like a millions of ideas about um, concept and blah, blah, blah. You, you keep on doing that for ages. Uh, maybe it doesn't turn out that good anyway. Uh, but in documentary, there is a tendency to that with some directors that they just want to go out and film, start filming. But I try as best as I can to talk through, maybe they have some references and maybe they have some ideas about what style they like because with that idea in your mind, you can also try to find the right tools for telling that type of story. So, yeah. yeah and then keep adjusting. Look at the rushes. We, me and Christina tend to do a tremendous amount of kind of late night, even if it's fast forward or jumping or seeing if, if this is plan we made is really working or how we're adjusting the visual language. And, you know, it's, it's not sitting and getting every sync or trying to edit in our mind. It's more this passive, where where it's going, is it working, and how to adjust, I think is really key. I'm not sure people do that enough with a visual kind of head on. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, there's a couple of little things before we give them a big round of applause. Lunch is from um, now until 2.15, so you have one hour. The program starts right on the dot of 2.15, and it will be with um, Walter Murch being interviewed by Tagi Amarani, and then we have a wonderful session after that on composition, music composition, and then finally looking at different formats of documentary, seri series documentaries. So um, have a great lunch, and let's give a big round of applause to both these men. Thank you. <laughs>